Hello film fans and welcome to this episode of The Shilokian. Now you know how in the first episode of Frozen Planet 2, David Attenborough said that this series of Frozen Planet wouldn't just be looking at um, the Arctic and the Antarctic, oh no, it would be looking at snowy environments around the world like mountains and tundra and all kinds of different cold places. Well, this episode is exclusively about the Arctic, and I did think when I saw the episode title on iPlayer, wow, that was fast, you reverted back to type. Having said all that, I did really enjoy this episode, so as is now customary for these reviews, I'm going to be look, taking a look at uh, three different things that I really enjoyed, and looking at them in a bit more detail, and then giving my thoughts for what we might um, see in the um, coming episodes of Frozen Planet 2. So, um... As has become a habit on this show, I'm now going to have to talk about orcas again. Now, in my last uh, review of Frozen Planet, uh, of the first episode, I said, I don't imagine that Frozen Planet 2 will probably have orcas to quite the same extent, particularly as they're not actually looking so in-depth at the Antarctic or the Arctic. And someone at the BBC obviously saw that review and immediately decided to make prove me wrong because this episode has orcas in it again. They do this a lot in Frozen Planet. I don't really know why. Well, I do know why. It's because they're exciting predators. <laughs> but somebody clearly has got an orca fetish and decided to put them in the second episode as well. Um, having said that, this episode does have quite a good orca scene. You know, it's got orcas hunting bowhead whales in um, northern Russia and it's quite exciting. I have to say, I think that similar um, sequences in, say, Blue Planet, when you see orcas hunting grey whale calves and in The Hunt, where they're hunting humpback whale calves, I think that those two were better. They um, have a better variety of shots in them. Um, the Blue Planet one is brilliant. I mean, I've talked about this in my Blue Planet review, so I won't go into too much detail, but the Blue Planet one is fantastic because it goes into such close-up um, detail. You really feel like you're there. And the Hunt one is gorgeous. It has, like, shots from underwater, and the water is this, like, beautiful blue azure colour. Oh, it's absolutely fantastic. This one is mainly shot from the air via drones. There's a few shots which were clearly taken... Um, 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 probably from like an inflatable alongside the orcas but it just has the orcas in it and I think it was probably shot elsewhere um, probably with the same similar pod of orcas but before they started hunting and then sort of inserted in which is fine I don't mind because um, I mean I wouldn't want to get in the water or anywhere near orcas if they were hunting bowhead whales but I can um, it, it definitely I think uh, means that the um, kind of the different variety of shots they get are less interesting but what makes this um, sequence really good is the score. Now, in my last episode, I was, wasn't was rude about the score, but I said it was nothing particularly special. Um, I've heard better scores in things like Seven Earths, One Planet. Um, having said that, it's done by Hans Zimmer, who also did that score. And in this episode, it was really, really good. And it really elevates the scene in um, this particular sequence with the orcas in it. Um, the bit when the orcas are hunting and sort of testing the bowheads for weaknesses is really good. It reminded me a lot of Zimmer's score for um, The Dark Knight and also his score for Dunkirk. It has that same kind of like, ticking sort of clock in the background, that sort of high tempo, and it gets this wonderful climax when you see one of the orcas sort of race towards that, um, one of the bowhead calves and then sort of breach over the top of it and drive it back underwater and sort of try, try and break its li um, ribs to make sure it can't breathe and then it sort of fades away and you get this much sort of more kind of like uh, quieter almost mournful melody with like strings and it's lovely and I like the way it's kind of that it really gives a sense of kind of doom and inevitability about it by this point you know the whale calf is going to die and you, you're just waiting to see the end and it fits in really nicely with David Attenborough's narration. Um, I don't know whether Hans Zimmer heard the narration beforehand. I suspect he didn't, but it sounds really good. Just the way they blended in. Um, David Attenborough is quite um, not exactly emotional when he's talking about it, but he, he, as he always does in these sort of um, sequences, he gives a really good kind of like um, kind of um, restrained, almost sober tone to the narration. Um, in the way that only he really can, and it fits in really nicely, and um, particularly the line he says when he says that the orcas, after hunting for several hours, now only eat the whale's tongue, and it fits in really nicely, both with the sequence, obviously, and the music, as it sort of um, has this like lovely string kind of melody over the top of it. My next favourite scene um, was the bit with the tufted orclets. Now, I've 
vaguely heard of these birds before. I think they're indigenous to like, well, obviously the Arctic Circle, uh, but more specifically kind of um, like uh, northern Siberia. Um, I might be entirely wrong about that, so I do apologise if I am. But I think that's where they come from. And they have these amazing kind of orange beaks and these tufted hairdos. Um, David Attenborough actually says they um, look like Elvis, which I thought was quite nice. Um, you rarely get pop culture references in BBC Natural History documentaries. Um, but it is a very apt description of them. They look amazing. But what I didn't realise was they have these actually quite interesting kind of courtship displays, which the um, uh, the show actually shows in quite a lot of detail. Um, the males, as is customary on a lot of birds, will display, they want to make these kind of like little sort of, um, croaking noises. And then the females come and take, check them out. And they're clearly um, interested uh, by the length of the tufts on top of their heads, or, you know, basic kind of like natural selection. Um, but what they then do is really interesting is they kind of like, sniff the back of their necks which is a weird thing to describe birds doing but apparently they produce this kind of tangerine like scent from the like glands in the back of their necks and then these females all swarm all over them um and it's it's really 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 interesting um david ashford actually described them as being a bit like groupies which i quite enjoyed <laughs> again i mean fitted in quite nicely with his you know elvis reference <laughs> and they but they do look a bit like groupies it, it's quite interesting apparently it rather unusually for what well, any species, particularly birds, and both the males and the females have like a say in which uh, mate they choose. I um, mean, it didn't quite explain how the males choose which females they want to breed with, you know, quite how they sort of the interaction over the scent um, allows males to choose like the, you know, the best mates. Um, but I did quite enjoy it. And it's really interesting. I mean, it's nothing really more than that. To be honest, um, it, it's intercut with the scene of an Arctic fox sort of, you know, hunting around the colony and um, to sort of lengthen the scene out a bit. Um, but I enjoyed it. It's quite interesting. You don't normally see that kind of um, sort of intimate behaviour among sort of small birds. And so I was quite interested and quite fascinated, in fact, that Frozen Planet 2 chose to focus on it. Um, I think the main sequence that people will take away from this episode is the one with the baby harp seal in it. One, it's incredibly cute. It looks like your characteristic fluffy um, baby seal and it's got quite a lovely, lovely shot of it learning to swim. And in fact, the bit at the end where they show you how they filmed certain sequences it actually shows you that particular sequence and it has the cameraman Hugh Miller in the water with this baby harp seal and it's gorgeous and it's not frightened of him at all it comes right up to the camera and you can see the producer actually says I can see his grin from here and it's lovely um, and the bit with it swimming when it first learns to swim is also really cute I mean for a start you rarely see um, sort of seals learning to swim I mean obviously I sort of vaguely knew that they must stop have to learn how to swim but it's something I've never seen before and it's quite funny watching it learn it looks like it's doing doggy paddle but it's not using its body in the same kind of sinewy way that adult seals do so it just looks really weird <laughs> it looks like kind of like a dachshund swimming and like with a really long body and then like short legs I mean I don't seals don't have legs but short flippers you know what I mean um the actually interestingly enough the um, sequence where it shows you how they filmed it actually ends quite darkly with the baby seal in a storm and they sort of say you know if it falls off it will drown and then it doesn't really show you what happened next i suspect it might well have drowned but they didn't show you that bit um so either it didn't drown but they wanted to give it more tension which sort of feels, still feels a bit weird and obviously it fits in quite nicely with their sort of like um their sort of um strong anti-global warming message which i fully approve of but I must admit, it seems a bit weird they didn't show you what happened. Or, of course, it was so harrowing that they didn't dare show you it. Um, which, again, you know, we sort of think surely that would have only increased their sort of harrowing global warming message. But, I mean, I'm sure there was a reason why they don't. And it's so lovely, the scenes itself. The, the really intimate bits they get between the seal and its mother. Um, the bit where they touch noses is really, really cute. And also the score, again, is lovely in those particular scenes. I mean, Hans Zimmer really outdid himself in this quite beautiful, sonorous music he gets. Um, and the snow falling down. It looks like a Christmas card. It's absolutely gorgeous. So, yeah, that was my review of uh, Frozen Planet two episode two i really enjoyed it i mean once again it seems to be sort of an upward trajectory i mean i like the first episode and this one's even better so and i'm really really looking forward to the next one i almost can't wait for next week and uh, um, the scene which appears to show a golden eagle dropping a deer off a cliff is to be honest 
Um, something that I've always wondered about ever since I was a child. It sounds a bit of a weird thing, I know. But I always wondered whether that actually happened. You know, described it in old nature books. And I always thought, do they really like knock deer off cliffs? It sounds like a, like a kind of thing somebody would make up, doesn't it? Um, so I'm really looking forward to seeing that bit. Um, and then reviewing it for all of you. Um, so thank you very much for watching. And that was the Sherlockian. And um, join me next week. I'm also now available on Twitter. If any of you are interested in following me, um, you'll get updates for like when I um, put videos out and also just my general thoughts on um, documentaries and life. I'm probably going to run polls as well for things I if anyone wants me to review. Um, so yeah, um, follow me if that's something you'd be interested in. Anyway, thanks very much for watching and I'll hopefully see you in the next one. Goodbye.